Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Douglas Kellner, our co-chair. I'm joined by uh, the other three uh, commissioners, co-chair Peter Kaczynski, uh, Commissioner Anthony Cassell, and Commissioner Andrew Spano. Um, first item of business today is approval of the minutes from May 2nd, May 18th, and June 27th. Is there a motion? Second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. All right, the minutes are approved. Uh, next item on our agenda is the uh, ballot access determinations. Uh, now, I have in front of me um, two pages, and all of them say prima facie review, but is that accurate that some of them are ruling on specifications? Yes, it's under the specifications with hearing is on the bottom, but no hearing one is on the top of the page. Okay, but that's not actually a prima facie review, then, right? I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, well, probably. A prima facie review to yeah. me means right. we're doing so that, it on that's our own correct. without objections. Mm -hmm. And where there are objections, we're ruling on the objection. Yes, yeah, so we should amend that. Just remove on the second page, prima facie review. So this, this concludes all of the determinations for the August primary. Pretty much. Just have more. Um, the, the, yeah. The August, August primary yes. one would have happened at the last board meeting. It was independent. It was so independent. independent right. So we're going to the general. I'm sorry. And then we still have some yeah. other ones that do need to be worked because uh, yesterday was the last day to receive the spec. So that's for independent nominating. Petitions for Senate and Congress. So that will come at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I, I would move to be ratified the activities of the hearing office. All right. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And I don't see anyone here who wants to be heard. Uh, so uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? All right. So. Uh, we have uh, adopted the staff report on petitions. Uh, the next item is to uh, go to the unit update. So we'll start with our executive directors, Kristen <coughs> Kowalski Stavisky and Todd Valentine. We lost Todd. Yep. Well, Todd, we don't see your I don't picture. See Todd, but are you on? I'm on. Todd. Okay. I see you. Well, no, I don't see you actually. Okay. Oh, okay. But you're there. You're All there. Right. I'm All there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, commissioners. Uh, it's been a busy few months here at the board. Uh, after Justice McAllister issued his order outlining ballot access, we at the board have facilitated filing periods for certificate of designations, designating petitions, and independent nominating petitions. And as uh, Brendan stated yesterday was the last day for objections to be filed on those independent nominating petitions for congressional and uh, Senate offices. So we processed objections, held ballot access hearings, and we will continue to do some objections that came in yesterday. On the redistricting front, we provided shape files to counties, advised them to make the required congressional and Senate changes while holding off on election district changes because as they are getting ready for the August primary, they're also, they were in the process of administering the June primary. So uh, we have worked closely with boards to provide any assistance they have needed for that. We also advocated that the special elections for Congressional District 19 and 23 be held on the same day as the August primary, as some boards would have to deal with resources of poll site locations, inspectors. OPS has provided guidance for the 22 counties involved in the special elections and the primary in the same day, and they're continuing to work with the e-poll book and voter registration vendors to help the county boards navigate that process. For the primary in June, we activated the Secure Election Center. We met with our statewide partners just before and after. We had a daily hold, but luckily we had no major issues. Uh, PIO and OPS provided support for counties throughout. On the Online voter registration and automatic voter registration front, we have a signed contract with the vendor. It is in the final process of going to 
the Office of the Attorney General for review and the Office of the State Controller. We are at the same time negotiating a memorandum of agreement with the other state that this vendor had developed their online program. So we are in the middle of doing that and uh, we've also seen a demo from the other states and we hope that we'll now be moving much quickly towards uh, online voter registration. The which and, and what, is, what is the target date now? Well, the, our, our date is May 2023. So we may be using an interim system if we're not ready with the vendor because we do have to hold um, sessions with the different county boards and with the different units. So we will have online registration in 2023. It just may so not be the final. B, you're saying. We always, yes, yeah, we have a plan B. For the Public Campaign Finance Board, we're finalizing the scope of work and we hope to be going to bid on or about August 1st. We've been working weekly with the Office of General Services through that procurement process. Uh, we've also changed the scope of the project, which I think we've talked to you throughout to ensure that we have one integrated system so that users internal and external will be able to go to candidate access the financial filing access, case management, public reporting, and it will all be seamless and it will, you will not have to log into two systems to see different reports. Chris, when you say we're going to bid. Yes. For? For the software solution. Is that going to be Good one point. bid or are there multiple bids or how's that going to be? It's one? one bid, but it's going to be a multi-year project, probably five years. So. The beginning bid will be for the software that's needed to do the auditing function and the payments for the public campaign finance bid. The last piece is sort of it's broken off into groups. The last piece is bringing the entire system together with candidate access, the uh, financial filing, and all of that. Are you together. anticipating one vendor? We are anticipating one vendor. You are? Yes. Well, we're hopeful it'll be one vendor. One vendor to do the whole project. Do the whole project. So there's been a lot of work done on business requirements for the Public Campaign Finance Board side. And right now, the different compliance and operations are meeting to work out those business requirements and functional requirements to make sure that everything can seamlessly come together. That's where we are with that. Um, space planning enforcement moved to the 10th floor. We have minor issues remaining, but they are nearly complete. Uh, administration moved into that space on the first floor and they're doing very well there. We have signed off on the furniture to accommodate the renovations to our existing first floor space. Staff moved into swing space and they are actually doing that construction right now. So we're hoping beginning of August, they should be able to move back into their renovated space. Um, members of the PCFB have moved into temporary space on the third floor as well. We have obviously realized some space from enforcement moving to the 10th floor, so it's a little bit better on the fifth floor right now, and we are still on track to begin the demolition and work on the fifth floor in February 2023. Uh, we still do not believe there's sufficient swing space identified to move everyone at once to make this project go as quickly as possible, which would be to empty this floor and reconstruct it at one time, but we continue to push in bi-weekly meetings with the Office of General Services to identify that space. As far as ongoing meetings, we continue to meet biweekly with the Division of Budget, the Office of General Services. We're working closely meeting with enforcement biweekly. We meet with the executive branch biweekly, and we continue our monthly conference calls with the Election Commissioners Association, uh, which has been uh, much needed in this time because they've been juggling a lot of different things. And, um, we are finalizing our guidance on FOIL, finally, and the county boards are very happy to get that. So we just got the final revisions from John Conklin, and we, we hope to send that this week. So that will be helpful for them. And as far as accessible absentee ballots, litigation, we did send information to the county boards regarding our settlement in the Hernandez matter and our new plan for accessible ballots, and we we're helping them we're working to complete that procurement process, and in the meantime, they are still facilitating accessible ballots as we've been doing throughout. And I will turn to Todd and see if he has anything to add. Otherwise, that concludes my report. No, I think that covered it comprehensively. Um, you know, I'm, I think that, that, yeah, nothing to add. <laughs>
Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, then we'll go to election operations. Tom Connolly and Brendan Lazor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, obviously, since our last meeting was on June 27th, the day after was the June 28th primary. Uh, we did support all of the boards in their efforts to administer uh, the primary election. We only had one fire. Um, that was in Jefferson County, and happily it was at the fire department, so they were able to put that out fairly quickly. Um, otherwise, it was a fairly smooth election day. It was the first run of the new campusing procedures, which had allowed for the scanning of absentee ballots prior to the election. Uh, we did implement software that allowed the county boards to aggregate the results from their central count and their precinct system so that those results could be uh, included in the election night reporting. Uh, that was a success, happily. Um, after the election, we did receive the data on absentee and affidavit voters as we do our, uh, our statewide data match um, within days after the election so that the, the counties have the information on potential matches of voters that may have voted in more than one county. Uh, before they canvass the affidavit ballot. This year we had just shy of a quarter of a million records, which we were able to turn around in less than 24 hours and get that out to the counties. Um, uh, we received an event nominating ballot access filing. So the, the quarter million records are people who voted by affidavit ballot? It's people who voted either by uh, absentee or affidavit ballot. And then we actually, those are the records that we received from the county board. And then we look at that and we also cross-reference all of the, the voter history that we get for in-person voting, for early voting on election day. And we look for matches based on criteria of certain number of characters of last name, first name, and date of birth. And then provide those potential matches to the county so that when they go to Canvas, your affidavit ballots, they can see did this person already vote in person or by a, a affidavit ballot, I mean absentee ballot or affidavit ballot somewhere else. And how many matches out of the quarter million? Uh, yeah. That I don't know because we actually have them broken up into 62 different files. So I'd actually have to go back and aggregate them, but we can, I'm sure we can find that out for you. Well, what, what's your guess? Um, it, you know? Uh, not offhand. I know in the past it has been a very small number. Yeah. I mean, if it gets into the hundreds. In the range of I'm, I'm trying to get the idea. Of, is it, are we talking about dozens? Or hundreds? Uh, I, I think statewide it could probably get itself into the hundreds. I know, for example, we were talking with Westchester, so I remember their spreadsheet in my mind, and I think they had seven matches or seven potential matches. Um, and again, some of we I think we do the first five letters of their last name, first three letters of their first name, and their date of birth. So it could very easily be a false match because it could be a Danielle and a Daniel. Um, or the last names, or they could be a very common name. And, and I will we, tell you from my experience as commissioner, we would get a list usually under 10, and very few, if any, were actual matches. We would then, the counties then do the research provided to them, and then they, they determine, no, this is not, as Tom said, it could be Danielle, Daniel, things like that. It's a very, very small number. Thank you. Um, we did receive, uh, obviously, we were receiving independent nominating petitions. Uh, we had, did have the determinations in front of you before. Uh, we also received a number of declinations of substitutions uh, after the primary as a result of primary losses. Uh, we did distribute. Which is the, also new this year. Right? Yep. We distributed the certification of the August primary ballot and also uh, the special elections for the 19th and 23rd congressional districts. Uh, as Kristen said, we did develop guidance uh, to help those boards. Uh, the 22 boards uh, that will run those two special elections had to program their machines so they would be able to use the same set of machines on election day for the two different elections so they wouldn't have to have two separate sets. Uh, we wanted to get prioritize the machine guidance first because they were programming their ballots in order to get them out in time for the military and overseas deadline 46 days before the election. Um, we are then following up uh, tomorrow. We have a number of phone calls with the e public vendors. And we'll also be working with the, the voter registration vendors of, of those counties to make sure that they are fully aware of what options they have for, um, for administering the election. Obviously, with the poll books, it can be a little tricky because the primary election has a 25-day cutoff and the special election has a 10-day registration cutoff. Uh, so there are different uh, cutoff deadlines for uh, who's eligible to vote in the election. And then on top of that, whereas the, um, the congressional primaries of uh, in August will be run on the new lines, the special elections are run on the old lines. And so that information has kind of already made its way out of the voter registration systems at the local level. So trying to kind of reconstitute that information to figure out who, who are the eligible voters in the under the old district boundaries who are eligible to vote in the election. 
So it's certainly challenging, but we have been working on it. Happily, most of the counties of the 22 are wholly contained uh, in both. On the 19th, there are four counties that are partially contained, and two of them um, are by town, so it's a lot easier to kind of figure out the boundaries. On the 23rd, uh, nine of the 11 in that district are wholly contained, and the other two um, that are partial also have uh, very clear-cut boundaries that uh, the election districts didn't have to be redrawn as a result of the new line. So we're hopeful that it'll all work its way out. It might be a little complicated for some of the boards if they can't use um, the same set of poll books or e-poll books for both elections, um, and they don't have enough to run two separate sets, they may have to consider running one election using e-poll books and one using a printed poll book. Uh, we did. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. So that issue. So do we know if the poll books can handle that sort of a situation where you have two different time frames for registering to vote? We have the 10-day and the so, four five day. Are they are they able to adjust in a way that I use one poll book for that poll site to identify a voter that those will vote one election but not, not another? So we have meetings with all three vendors tomorrow to kind of to go over this. I mean, in my head, I've already come up with a way that it can be done, but it's not necessarily easy to implement because it requires the counties to do a lot more manual um, alteration of the data that comes out of their voter registration systems before it gets into the e-poll book systems. And then with the 10-day cutoff as a special, you're also kind of running up against the first day of early voting. So they don't have a lot of time to do that alteration and turn around. So it might just be easier on them just to kind of take a smoother path of either being able to to do two different sets um, or one electronic, one printed. But if, it, if their system, if any of the e-public systems can handle it in a way where they can filter out what ballot they might uh, provide to the voter based on a registration date or some other criteria or flag, um, that's what we're hoping to find out tomorrow. So it may be dependent upon the vendor yes. as to how you're actually going to be able to do this. And all three vendors are, in, are involved in between the two uh, districts. So some boards may have to use paper poll books, and some may not. That's right. a potential here. Yes. So when a voter presents for both the special and the primary, they get two ballots at one time, or they have to go back to the line again? Two ballots at one time. And they feed them into the same? Yep. The same, same machine has been programmed to accommodate both uh, elections. And that's done. I mean, that's not a problem. Correct. We had already worked with all of the 22 counties or Dominion counties, so we had worked with Dominion uh, to get guidance put together. We did give that out to all of the county boards. We did have a webinar in which we went over that guidance and answered any questions they may have had. Um, they were able to program them. The, those ballots have already gone out, or at least the military and overseas ballots already went out last week. Uh, so it looks like they will be able to uh, run both elections on the same set of machines because needing to have two separate sets of machines was definitely going to be a logistical burden for a number of boards. Going back to the June primary, are all the absentees received after Election Day now being counted or then counted? So uh, obviously there, anything that was received prior to Election Day and that was processed pursuant to the new canvassing laws, which is within four days of receipt, um, were scanned either on the day before the first day of early voting or after the close of polling well, that, the last that day. Know. Right. So that anything received after that part would be canvassed after the election. Some boards may chase, choose to do it on a rolling basis. Some of them may choose to do it at one time. The only thing that changed was the time frame for processing. Um, on or after election day, upon receipt of an absentee ballot, you had to process it within one day instead of the four days before the election day. But then obviously there's a cure process at play. So the last day that an absentee ballot could have been timely returned to a county board would have been July 5th. And then if that uh, absentee ballot required a cure, the last day that that cure would be received would be this Friday. So with respect to the early camp, the new rules uh, prior to election, mm -hmm. were any complaints or questions received here in terms of either from the news media and candidates who didn't, did most of them understand the new rules? Was there any confusion, any questions raised about this new process? Well, as far as the press, I don't know, Jen, if you were yeah. We had a few inquiries, but it was very easy to explain. So it wasn't... Any I, complaints received from the news media about transparency or inability to see what's going on? No, I, no, I didn't get well, any. Somebody wanted to observe, they had to appear at least twice a week in every poll. Uh, it depends on how, it depends on whatever schedule the county set. Right. So the right. county could actually literally do it every single day if they wanted to, right. or they could do it twice a week, which would allow them that four-day kind of window. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, commented on earlier in an earlier meeting was that, uh, and I know in the elections world, 
you only often hear about the bad news and not the good news, but the fact that we were actually successful in, in getting all of those absentee results in the unofficial election night reporting. Right, and, and you know, we didn't get any Ray Ra, way to go guys, but we also didn't get, <laughs> you know, we also didn't get any kind of complaints. And so, which was interesting because there usually always were the complaints about, you know, when are we gonna get these results? When are we gonna get these results? And so now we've given them a whole boatload more results on election night and, you know, it's silence, which I guess is we'll just take. That's, that's good enough as a, as a compliment as we'll get in the election world. We, Todd and I are still talking about getting results. The issue of getting the results timely from the county is, is still something I think we have to explore. And we, we discussed it a little bit that night because we are still waiting on certain counties until very, very late. Sometimes we have to call them on their cell phone. Oh. <laughs> that went dark. Put another nickel in there. <laughs> yeah, so that is something that's on our mind. We want, we want to figure out a way to make that easier. Um, let's see where was I? All right. Oh, as I mentioned, obviously last Friday was the deadline, the state deadline for getting out military and overseas ballots. Uh, we worked with PIO and IT to kind of make sure um, that all the counties had uploaded them. Uh, there obviously were some last-minute ballot changes, particularly in the, the 18th Congressional District. Uh, so we had to make sure, because the uh, judge in that matter uh, enjoined the county boards from sending out any ballots without a candidate's name on it. So, but uh, they were, we did kind of give them the heads up that we that was likely to come down the pike last week, and they were able to make the programming changes and have the ballots ready to go. So all three of them in that district uh, were able to upload ballots um, with the candidate's name on it that the judge had required to be put on it. Uh, in time to meet the deadline. Uh, we are also, we've been collecting paperwork, as we do, lots of paperwork, lots of surveys, the audit paperwork and the statements of Canvas for the June primary, uh, and then for the August primary, we're collecting candidate notices and sample ballots. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, we have been uh, involved in working on the, the procurement of the accessible absentee um, portal. Uh, we will be distributing additional guidance to the county board for the August primary, just to kind of um, remind them of the process that needs to be followed. Uh, we will also be inquiring as we do after each election as to the, the numbers of accessible absentees requested, how many were sent, how many were received, how many were counted, how many were rejected. Uh, that's also pursuant to the settlement agreement. Um, <coughs> we also are continuing to work with ITPIO and others about the absentee tracker, uh, which went into effect this year. And then also voter registration systems, uh, we did have a new voter registration system uh, that we approved earlier in the year. Or was it last year? When was next? Year? Uh, last last year? year? December. Okay. Yeah. And so that, that is one of the newer um, VR vendors at Roll in the State in Shenango County. Uh, we do have another demo tomorrow from Noink, who is one of the ePublic vendors. They're looking to give a demonstration of their voter registration system. Uh, I also know that I think 10X has, has expressed some interest in another ePublic vendor and bring their voter registration system um, before us for review and possible approval. Uh, with regard to voting systems, Dominion, it's, it's undergoing certification testing, so that's kind of chugging away. Uh, clear ballot, there are two things on clear ballot that there have been. Uh, clear count 2.2, which is their central count system, it's an, up, it's an update to their the currently certified system. Uh, they are at the end of that process. Uh, SLI, our testing lab, is finalizing their reports. After they're done, uh, NICE Tech will review their reports and will provide their own reports to us. We will then put those together, possibly put our own kind of executive summary on top of it and provide it to you, uh, likely for consideration at the next board meeting to approve. That is, like I said, just an update to their current central count system. It alleviates a couple of things, one of which was an issue that really impacted mainly in New York City because there was a limitation on the number of ballot styles that the software could handle. Uh, that has not been an issue for New York City uh, in the primaries because um, it's not a general election, but it will be an issue for the general. So uh, we're hoping to have that software all done and before you for a certification vote before the, uh, so that it can be used in the general possibly. Um, in addition, ClearBout also has their Clear Vote um, software, which is their first foray into the, um, the precinct voting system market. Um, that is going to be a whole new system. There is a resolution on the agenda later on to permit us to move forward with testing of that. Uh, HART has completed and passed the EAC federal certification, the system that they submitted to us. Uh, they were putting through the federal certification first. They're going to now leverage that federal certification for kind of what we call transfer credit, 
uh, where, where applicable for the, the New York requirements and the New York process. So we're going to be starting the, um, the New York requirement testing uh, now. Um, NYSEC is reviewing the test matrix that SLI has prepared, so we should be underway for the state requirement testing uh, very soon. And then lastly, we have ESNS who has submitted an application. Uh, they finalized that, we've reviewed it. Um, they've done kind of all the pre-application work, and we also have a resolution later on the agenda for you to permit us to move forward with testing of their new system. Uh, I think that's all I have at the moment. Brendan? Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Are there any questions? I'm good. Okay, and uh, we move to our councils. Uh, uh, Brian Quayle and Kim Galton are both engaged, and I see Aaron Suggs is here, our deputy, and I see that Kevin Murphy, the other deputy council, is online. Kevin, you want to turn your video on? Oh, well. Aaron, are you uh, going to sure, give yeah. the report? Yeah, right I'll give the report. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so council and clients have been uh, very busy since our last of the meeting. Uh, we've had a number of uh, ballot access cases. Uh, so we'll go through some of them. Uh, uh, Sandusky versus Wilson, which is a Unite Party invalidator case. Uh, yesterday, um, the effort to uh, validate uh, Mr. Wilson's petition was rejected by the court. We also have a number of libertarian cases, uh, two O'Connor v. Uh, Sharp and Sharp v. O'Connor. Um, both of those are still, uh, have not been resolved, uh, but I'll note there was an application by the libertarians in the Second Circuit for similar relief uh, that was rejected. Um, we also have another libertarian case, Hosser v. O'Connor, um, that's returnable in Albany County on July 25th. Uh, we have another case for uh, Voight versus Schreiber, um, the candidate Shiroff uh, remains on the ballot in that one and was decided in June. Um, for the old uh, Senate District 60, we had Paraback v. Car Carlisle. Uh, the designation, designated position was valid in that case. Um, we have two uh, EGRU cases for uh, new uh, CB26. Uh, um, that case is was returnable uh, on Monday or last Friday. I apologize. Aaron, are these are these line by line objections that are going to court now, or are these general? I mean, some of them are line by line. A lot of them are. I don't know. Um, most of them are not. Really? So there's other issues at play besides I mean, signature validation. Yeah. Like constitutional issues. There's some service issues. There was some. Um, issues. That was a. So we have some line by lines, but we also have a lot of service issues. Um, uh, I'll note in, in for uh, old CD number one, uh, which is now entirely within Suffolk County, I believe. Uh, there's still some cases involving that, but um, Suffolk County is handling that. In CD two, we have two cases uh, uh, Cornicelli and Reckenbreck. Um, both of those cases, uh, our determinations have been upheld. Um, in Albany County, we have Mills v. Uh, Peterson. This is the case that uh, Tom was talking about. Mills was restored to the ballot, um, and uh, an appeal was taken in that, in that case. Uh, we also have Stora, Stora case for the Freedom Party. Um, that's returnable in Kings County on the 22nd of July. Um, and then we also had a, the LaRouche Independent Party, um, which they withdrew their challenge since there was no challenge to um, uh, the petition. They withdrew that case. Um, last one in the ballot access realm is uh, was the Grace case for the Republican uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, he uh, had uh, initially appealed, but then, then withdrew the appeal. <clears throat> Uh, so we also have a number of redistricting cases, as I'm sure you know. So, you know, Harkin Rider, there was a 5 uh, May 20th order. Uh, we had three separate intervener or motions to intervene. Um, all three were denied. Um, there was one appeal by the parent party, which uh, oral arguments were today, which Brian is at. Um, so I'll show up here what happened uh, 
um, from him later. Um, we also had uh, Nichols v. Uh, Hochul, uh, which was trying to invalidate the assembly lines. Um, the first department did rule that the lines were invalid, but then remanded to the Supreme Court to determine the process for the new lines in 2024. Uh, and the Supreme Court has set uh, briefings on that uh, for August 8th and arguments for August 19th. Um, we also had a legal win voters case uh, in the Southern District. They wanted new designated positions and extended um, independent petition deadline. Uh, they also had a motion for a preliminary injunction, which was denied. Um, we had a, another legal women voters case in Albany County, which was uh, wanted to cancel the June primary for assembly. Um, that was denied by the Supreme Court and the Appellate Division, and they were denied twice for leave to appeal for the court of appeals. Um, in other cases, the upstate jobs, jobs case, uh, cross appeals have been taken, um, and the appeal is pending. Our reply uh, is due in September. In the Schmidt case, the preliminary injunction was granted to the Libertarians, uh, which allows out-of-state petition circulators to circulate their independent nominating petitions. Our answer is due next week. Um, we had another League of Women Voters case uh, related to the 25-day registration cutoff. That case uh, may be mooted by the uh, legislation that's pending before the governor. Um, we have the D Triple C case. Uh, a motion for a preliminary injunction was uh, is still pending. Uh, this case involves expanding cures, folks north deadlines, requiring wrong county absentees to be accepted, and wrong church site affidavits to be counted. Um, we're in discovery in that case, and uh, it's ongoing. Uh, in the Hernandez case, <clears throat> uh, this case was settled, but there is a motion pending about uh, about the remedy applying the remedy to the August primary. Um, and then there's also a case from Judicial Watch, um, which has been in the news, but we have not been served. We haven't seen that yet. In terms of compliance uh, unit, uh, the staff has spent a lot of time on specs, but they also have uh, doing their normal duties. Um, they've received, a uh, total received um, filings uh, as of today is 190,759. It's completed 166,716, and there's uh, 9,500 uh, not completed. Uh, 4,060 reviews have been completed since the last board meeting, and since January, uh, 1,446 committees and 14, 1,478 candidate, candidate records have been terminated. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you. So uh, we'll uh, turn to Michael Johnson. <clears throat> Can anyone hear me? Mike? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Hear me? Okay, great. Barely, uh, though. And you need to turn on your video. It is on. You guys can't see me? No, we no, can't see you, but we really can't even hear you, Michael. We, you need to get closer or something. Can you hear me now? Isn't that great? Hey, we have our volume up all the way, so we hmm. just need to. Okay. Can you hear me now? Better. That's better. That's better. Yep. Okay. You. Um, but your video is off. I Is it on now? Because it's certainly showing on my end that it's on. It could be a bandwidth or something. It could be a bandwidth or something. No. Well, go ahead. We we don't have video, but you should go ahead. Okay. Um, you guys received our quarterly report, which shows what's been going on state in the in the unit. Um, the Things that have happened with you so far. We tomorrow will be onboarding a new attorney to uh, backfill a, a vacancy that we that we had several months ago, and you know, division of budget approved it. So I'm grateful for that. Um, the we're waiting for the July periodic non-filer list to come out. Once that comes out, 
what we will do is we will sort of do a match with that and see how many non filers have LLC issues still outstanding so we can continue the LLC project. Um, we are in the process of reviewing a, a, a case management system for us in terms of being able to track all the enforcement cases. Um, we're also in the process of uh, continuing the development of a judgment tracking system, and that's being done in conjunction with the IP folks. We're also looking at, we're formatting all of the determinations that have been done to date for accessibility purposes so that once we're up and running with our website, there is no problem with anyone being able to see the determinations. Um, we also just updated our, our Westlaw system to the new Westlaw, so we are pretty excited about that. Um, all of the cases that I, I that you guys have on your agenda, those cases were not part of our quarterly report, and they will appear on the third quarter report. So just so you know, if, if you're wondering why those cases don't show on that, um, we sent out a, an email and letter dealing with the deficiency notices. Um, as far as the deficiencies are concerned, back in May, we sent out approximately, I want to say about 77 emails and letters with regard to deficiencies. We probably have resolved about 30 of those or so. The others I'm planning on having, I, I spoke to compliance unit, uh, Brian Quayle, we're going to have to sit down to discuss next steps because I personally think a lot of them don't necessarily warrant enforcement actions. So it'll be more along the lines of what else can be done from a compliance perspective. We didn't send out um, anything with regard to June for deficiency notices because the deficiency notice that we got in June, I, I spoke to Brian Quayle and there were still questions with regard to the accuracy of the list. So in the best interest of, of everyone involved, we decided let's just hold off on this until we can be assured of the accuracy of it. And we'll pick things up, hopefully, with regard to accuracy with the July periodic filing. Um, anything other than that, you know, the agency is still fielding a bunch of, or the unit, excuse me, still fielding a bunch of different complaints and following up our complaints and closing matters. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Like I, 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 on your report, I'm just trying to I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand how to read this. So you have a uh, category cases remaining open, and you cite 6203.4a. Then April 115, May 85, June 96. I'm trying to understand how to how to how to read that. Does that mean that? You had 115 open cases in April. It went down to 85 in May and back up to 96 in June. That's correct. And that's because a lot of the cases that were closed were, were old cases that were either a older than two years old or, or simply should have been closed, but just simply never closed. And as far as the cases going back up, that simply reflects newer cases that have come in since, since May. Okay, well, that actually goes to my next question. And so I noticed in the packet that you gave us of closed cases, the cases start, as I see it, they start around September of 21 and go right up to June of 22. And that's the body of cases that you've given us today that you're closing. Does that mean your backlog has been satisfied? For the most part, yes. For the most part, the backlog has been satisfied. There are still some that are still out there, but for the most part, yes, the backlog has been satisfied. So I, I, I'm just trying to understand why we're seeing cases from now when there's still a backlog that hasn't been resolved. I don't understand the question, Peter. The question is why I'm seeing cases that arrived in June of 22, but I'm not seeing cases that you're telling me haven't been resolved from maybe years ago. 
Well, when I close cases, it's more along the lines of what's in front of me. And like I explained to you guys at an earlier meeting, I'm sort of still triangulating, working forward and working backward at the same time. Because my position early on was trying to work from the back forward only would cause a backlog in the newer cases. So what you're in effect seeing is, is me still triangulating, working forward and backward at the same time. Do you have any sense of how many old cases are still out there? Uh, not, not off the top of my head because I, I mean, I can give you a number, but I, I don't know for certain whether or not those cases have been closed by the previous chief enforcement council or have they just simply been put aside and no action was ever taken. Yeah. Well, I think we can say as a board that we didn't see any cases closed by the previous enforcement council. Let me just start there. So I believe anything that's still in your file that is uh, open uh, or still exists, there I don't believe was a single case that was brought to this board for a formal closing by the board as mandated by statute. So I would suggest to you that whatever you've got in your office has not been closed unless you've closed it. So I think you can start right there. Okay. So know that. So I'm just I'm just trying to understand you know kind of where we are in these old cases because I'm seeing a lot of new stuff. But I'm just not seeing this old stuff, and I'm 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 wondering what's happened to it. I'm sure the statute of limitations issues probably that attached to some of these that may be running on these older cases, and I'd hate to see the statute run when there may be some credit or you know validity to the complaint but it's not being addressed in a timely manner in the statute of limitations run. So I'm trying to understand where you are as far as trying to bring those cases to a uh, conclusion. Well, at, at this point, what I'm still doing is like I said, I'm still working backward, still looking at cases that are within the statute of limitations and whether or not those have been closed by the chief enforcement council or not. Now she may not have brought the information to you guys, but I'm still trying to determine, okay, so what was her finding or her determ determination in those cases? The ones that are beyond the statute of limitations, those are the ones that I just, I just have to close. So you would want a list of those cases? Well, I'm trying to figure out where we are, because I mean, I, I just, you know, having gone through the packet here today, I just know these are all basically new complaints. I mean, these are complaints that have come in in the last six months or so. But my understanding from our discussions over the last year that you've been here is that there's a whole backlog of cases in your office that were, which doesn't surprise me, because as I said, we've never seen, we never saw a single case closed by the previous uh, uh, Chief Enforcement Council. So I'm sure there must be a huge backlog in your office of old cases, and I'm trying to understand what's happened to those. Because having seen so many new cases being resolved so quickly, I'm just wondering why we're not seeing any of the old cases that have been sitting there for probably years without, without any formal attention. Now, maybe she, had, maybe she looked at them, I don't know. But there's been no formal resolution to them because we haven't seen them as a board, and under the statute, you can only close a case if you report it to the board. So I'm concerned about the status of these old cases and why we're not seeing any of those. Well, I'm still going through old cases. Heck, I, I, actually, I'm still opening boxes of old matters. So, I mean, for me to sit here and tell you exactly how many cases there are, I could give you a number, but it wouldn't be accurate. So I'd rather simply not give you an, a, a number that I know may not necessarily be accurate. No, fair enough. And I, but, but I mean, I know from my own experience, there's, there's got to be a large number simply because we haven't seen them. So there must be, and I know from the numbers you're reporting to us, you're getting complaints in regularly. So it isn't like there weren't any complaints being filed. I'm sure there were. Uh, I don't think this year should be much different from previous years. So my guess is there's a reasonably large number in your office. And what concerns me is I'm not seeing any of those, but I'm seeing brand new cases being resolved, you know, rather quickly, which is great. But I, but I wonder what happened to the old cases. Well, like I said, the old cases, there's, I'm still working on old cases. 
in all fairness, I, I'm trying to get the matters resolved as they appear in front of me because I don't like hearing complaints from people saying, you know, why is this taking six months or a year to resolve? I'm trying to prevent that from happening. So I'm trying to work on the cases as quickly as I can that come in front of me while trying to devote as much time as possible to the cases that were there from the previous chief enforcement count. Well, I, I, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, Michael. I'm just concerned not seeing any evidence of the old cases being addressed. They're still coming. While it's, it may not be a perfect system to you, it's a system nonetheless, and it's the system that I'm trying to work with in terms of dealing with a backlog of cases. So is your system that we're going to we're going to continue to see new complaints as they come in quickly, uh, yeah. but the old cases may not may not come before us. No, you're going to still see new cases come before you, and you will see old cases. There will be a mix. How many? I I can't give you a number. No, I understand you can't. I guess I'm not as worried about the number probably as just the process because I don't see any of those old cases in today's packet. So I'm just wondering what happened to them and, and what your plan is to address them. My plan is the plan that I outlined several months ago, which is continuing to work forward on new cases while at the same time working backward on the old cases. The old cases just simply take a little bit more time because there's a lot more paperwork involved. There's a lot more in terms of things that were or were not done that I would not have or would not have done. So it involves me sort of unraveling what's there and trying to piece it back together. Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Okay. Uh, uh, so now we turn to uh, public information, John Conklin and Jennifer Wilson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, PIO, like all the other offices, has been very busy with the June primary and pending August primary. In May, we responded to 141 FOIA requests. In June, 182. We've been getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of requests for the political calendar, information on running for office, signature requirements, inquiries about both primaries, um, during the early voting period, we also staffed throughout to make sure we had somebody here to handle any phone calls from the public. For the website, we posted the updated deadlines and calendar for the August primary and special elections. We also post additional guidance for candidates running for congressional and Senate offices, uh, including the certificate of designation for candidates who had previously filed and had ballot access. We posted election night reporting for the June primary. We've also been working with enforcement on adding additional content to the website for enforcement. And we worked with the Campaign Finance Board on their successful website launch, which is up now. So I'm sure at the next meeting, they'll talk a lot about that. It's at uh, pcfb.ny.gov. It looks great. They worked with ITS on that, and it, they did a great job. And today, we posted the revised Campaign Finance Handbook, which the staff is very excited about. That was <laughs> another thing that we're very excited to move forward on. Tom mentioned that uh, we worked with the county boards and IT on Move Act compliance to ensure all of our military and overseas ballots went out last Friday. And we also had worked on that for the June primary as well. For early voting, we again tracked the early voting vote totals for all the 62 counties and reported those out to any public inquiries, any uh, press inquiries. And for the August primary right now, we're just finalizing all of the early voting sites for that. that was done over the weekend, we're just making sure that NICE voter is updated with those sites so that for August we'll have the correct sites in there for early voting. For the ballot proposal that you all be considering later today, we started conversations with New York State Press Services. We'll again have to run ads in newspapers in all 62 counties to make sure that we are in compliance with state law. So we started conversations with press services this past month. And we have also um, started conversations with our translator to make sure that that will be translated into Spanish, Bengali, Chinese, and Korean. So after today's meeting, we'll move ahead with that. For social media, we participated in the National Association of State Election Directors Social Media Working Group in July. There was a representative on there from Twitter who has offered a training to New York State. So we are just finalizing the date for that for counties and for us to participate in to look into misinformation, spotting that on Twitter 
reporting that and making sure it doesn't get out of hand. In May and June, we posted 22 tweets and 10 Facebook posts about upcoming primary deadlines, voter registration, absentee voting, early voting, and also on election day. And we also used our social media to respond to any questions or inquiries from the public regarding the primary. Um, we also further informed about the new absentee voting procedures regarding the use of affidavit for absentee voters. And um, as was mentioned, we didn't get any complaints about that. So we're pretty pleased with that. And for traditional media, we continue to field inquiries about both the primary and then also campaign finance reporting for the May, June, and July periodics. And then finally, grants. Grants is always very busy. Continue to administer our nine grants, our, our HAVA grants, and also our early voting grants, working on the contract extensions for those. Our prepaid postage grant, our $4 million, we're just finalizing the contract now with OGS. So that was scheduled to begin July 1, and counties will be reimbursed back until July 1. That covers various expenses related to the new law requiring prepaid postage for absentee ballots and also for absentee ballot applications. So we are hoping to have those final contracts soon, and either way, the counties will get paid back to July 1. So. That is uh, the full report. Is there is there any way to quantify the number of calls you got about running for office <laughs> now in the past? I would say, well, operations gets a lot of calls as well about running for office. So I would say it's probably in the one to two hundred zone. Is that higher than normal? Did you know? I know um, you're new. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know a lot of them also are president. A lot of people are very serious about running for president. So some of them are the ones who 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 Good afternoon, Commissioners. So as you probably heard by now, it's been a busy summer here at the Board. Um, IT has spent much of uh, our time in preparation and support of the two primary elections and related activities for the various units and the affected systems, uh, many of which have been mentioned here, such as election night reporting, the absentee and affidavit ballot comparison, uh, the upload of the new ballots, and so forth. Um, this Friday is the... Uh, July 15th is the deadline to file July periodic reports. So our habit side of the team is monitoring performance and providing assistance uh, and answering questions as needed on that. Um, there have also been uh, updates to our electronic filing system in support of the public campaign finance uh, project. Um, and that is as an interim solution until the ultimate final solution is procured and in place. Um, and speaking of public campaign finance, uh, their new website was successfully developed and deployed last week. Um, assistance from IT and in collaboration with uh, the unit the there. Um, and uh, as was also discussed earlier, uh, IT continues to participate in finalizing the scope of work for procuring the final software for that. Uh, we also discussed uh, earlier OVR AVR. Of course, they have that science contract there and continue to work on the memorandum of understanding with the other states. Um, and likewise, at the same time, continue to work on our plan B backup solution in the interim. Um, the modified absentee ballot request portal is currently up and running and has had a variety of uh, added modifications and enhancements. Uh, the absentee ballot tracker. Uh, was successfully deployed on schedule earlier this year. Um, and uh, as was discussed, we're currently able to display all the required data elements there that were provided, and we work with local VR vendors to, uh, on their timeline for getting all relevant data elements to us. Uh, in space expansion, again, this is uh, mostly covered, but uh, we have completed our connectivity for the, uh, the new locations, uh, some of our development team, is currently uh, in the swing space in the building while their primary space is being built out. In terms of cybersecurity, um, as was also mentioned uh, during the June primary election cycle, we had our regular touch points on a daily basis with our various security partners. Um, that was coordinated by our, uh, by our Chief Information Security Officer, Ben Spear. 
We're happy to report that there were no significant cybersecurity incidents that occurred during that time. Um, our Secure Election Center infrastructure team will regularly monitor our network to review any unusual activity, and we work with a variety of partners and vendors to keep our security measures updated and fresh with various uh, new technology. Um, the Secure Election Center staff has also begun contacting county boards and county IT staff regarding completion of cyber regulation reporting, those will be cyber regulations passed last year, and which are due on August 1st of this year. Uh, that uh, communication with the counties will continue to ramp up over the next few weeks. Um, we continue to work with uh, NYSEC and numerous counties on implementation of their risk remediation plans as well. Um, and we work with the uh, SUNY Center for Technology and Government. There has been an ongoing winter elections infrastructure project, um, and phase two of that project is, uh, is in process. And lastly, uh, we'll be attending uh, in August the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center meeting that's hosted in August by the Center for Internet and Security, which is a good opportunity for discussions with other partners and representatives from other state agencies. All right, well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have any old business on the agenda. Our first item of new business is uh, Resolution 22-10, which is the certification and approval of the abstract in form of submission for the clean water, clean air, and clean job environment of on back uh, 19th of 2022. Um, so the legislature adopted this. Has this gone through the procedure? Yes, it did. So, so this is the draft that has yeah, been sent to us. Oh, yes, you don't have a window. Oh, I think I do. No, I mean, yeah. This yeah. is nothing different than what I got. Nothing right. different. No, 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 I, don't no, I, have, I don't think it's in the full window. I, 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 I have it. I have it. Guess what's online? Yes. Yes. My understanding is that the legislature prescribed the language for the proposition. Yes, it was sent to the. So all we were responsible for in conjunction with the AG was doing the, the abstract. Yes. Okay. So the form on the ballot was dictated by the legislation, right? Yes. Yeah. And relief. <laughs> some way, yeah. Just as well. All right, so uh, I'll move to uh, adopt the resolution. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Right. Resolution is adopted. All right, the next item on our agenda is uh, Resolution 22-11 to permit certification testing of uh, Leshkin systems and software's EDS 6.3.0.1 voting system. Um, so this is just to start the process. Correct. And I guess I've said it before, I'm not sure why the commission was asked when somebody wanted to either. start the application. But, uh, that's that statutory? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's statutory. I know for the modifications, we do not bring them before you. Uh, but whenever it's a brand new system submission, the process normally is we have an application process. There's a lot of information that the vendor must provide to us before we even kind of say that it's complete. I think the question is, why would we reject an application? I, I don't know. This is, <laughs> this is certainly a process in which I inherited it, but if you I know, but I mean, stop bringing them before. I mean, can, can you envision a situation where we'd say, no, we don't want to test your your machine for some reason? I, I cannot. Okay. Because so, it's not our money Correct. that we're using to test it. It isn't like we're protecting state money here, right? We it's the vendor that. money. Well, we do have staff time. Well, we have staff time. That's sure. true. So maybe that's the reason. But, but. but I, I certainly would not object if no. we change the policy so that when the vendor makes an application, you just proceed on the application and notify it. Sure. And your, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't. Report. I wouldn't object either. I don't think. Good uh, idea. Just so I can understand, though, this particular one is this the one we saw last 
year so, that well, was rejected by this board? So that, yes and no. Is this a resubmission of it's, the same basic machine with, with, with amendments to try to address those issues? Is that how I understand so it? So what has been submitted is, is the hardware is the same hardware as it was last year. Okay. Um, it is a completely new uh, piece of software and firmware. So whereas the old version, which was 6041, uh, was running on Windows 7, um, this did have all the same hardware components, the Excel, uh, the DS200, uh, the DS850, 450, and I can't remember if the 950 was part of last year's. Uh, but regardless, they, you know, after last, year, uh, last year's process, they basically decided to not just make the changes to the Excel, because all of the other components of 6041 were certified, uh, they decided to um, just Resubmit an entirely new system. So the, the 6401 is a whole new piece of software. It's on Windows 10. Uh, it does have the DS200, the DS300, which are the precinct scanners. It does have the ExpressVote XL about marking device, which was uh, what was brought before us last year. But they did address the uh, discrepancies, or they believe they have addressed the discrepancies that were cited in the reporting from the last round. Uh, and then they have three different central count scanners that are part of the overall system. So, so does this system include a ballot marking device that is in the same physical cabinet as the scanner? Uh, yes. And that's the that's the Express Vote X. Correct. All right. Um, and. Um, what what is your tentative schedule for when the public testing will take place and what the when the final? Report? Um, as far as the final report, it, it's going to be I think sometime next June is the current tentative end time for the testing. At least according to our testing partners, that can certainly change. Um, obviously, that process is just based on going through the testing one. Uh, as they go through the testing, if they find any kind of discrepancies or issues that the ESNS will have to make adjustments to, that can certainly push that, that time frame out more. Uh, as far as the public testing of this, I, I, we haven't scheduled anything yet. Normally the process uh, has been to this point, which may be changing now, has been that we kind of wait until we get the permission to move forward from the commissioners, then we have a kickoff meeting with the vendor, then we start doing weekly meetings. And so one of the first things that we probably would discuss on those meetings would be when can we schedule at least a public demonstration of the uh, of the system for those uh, individuals or groups that might be interested in kind of having a hands-on experience with, with the hardware. And, and if there is uh, someone in the public who wants to be informed of that process, how do they get on that list? Um, I mean, we, we don't necessarily send out an email blast when we do it. We will always publish those dates on our website. Um, certainly in advance so that people know when we will be doing a public demonstration of any of the software. I will absolutely discuss it in any of the board meetings, but if they wanted to reach out to uh, election operations or myself uh, personally, I'm happy to kind of make them aware of whenever that date gets set. Um, now I noticed that on the website, um, we have a, a high level category for uh, HAVA related materials that still includes a lot of the legacy materials from 2005 through 2008 when we were going through the initial certification. Um, but there is very little that um, seems to be on the website about currently pending certification projects. And I'm wondering if that's really backwards. That the HAVA stuff should, you know, I don't mind leaving it there or burying it somewhere where it's not quite so prominent, you know, where it's on the on the home page. But um, uh, could could we uh, update that. the website in a way that shows all of the pending uh, certification and and review applications, sure. so that also uh, uh, covers uh, what you're working on with respect to poll books and um, any other system, uh, inf information system and technology reviews that are ongoing so that people can get that information. 
I know that some states have very excellent websites that are very thorough. I mean, I'm impressed by what California has, um, where it's not very difficult to get a lot of detailed information on their testing programs for each system. But we can certainly work towards doing that. When we had originally done the HAPA section on the website was actually much more robust previously, and we had to kind of trim that down uh, due to the inaccessibility of some of the content. Uh, and then we just started to start have it's undertaken some efforts to start rebuilding that section, especially um, with something like a pipeline that kind of shows where each of the different systems um, are at in the process, much like the way that the EAC does at the federal level. Um, we have had some staff turnover, but we do have are completing the machine staff. Uh, is uh, the new individual is starting uh, next Thursday, so I'm hopeful that we can kind of reignite that uh, effort and get more stuff on the information uh, on the website. All right. Well, that's good. Um, you know, my own suggestion is that uh, that the Hava should not be a bullet link on the home page, but should be um, subordinate to something else like voting system testing or something like that. And as I say, I don't object to having that old historic information there, although I think it's at a higher level on the, on the, in the organization of our website than it, than it ought to be. For example, I have all the competing plans when we couldn't agree on voting system and we had to go to Judge Sharp with our alternative systems. I don't know that all that's right. Should be it's the bottom of the, yep. Yeah. Do it in reverse chronological order. Yeah. But most but, on top of But if you want to find out what they're actually looking at now. That's the weird thing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, okay. is a, this is the system that the configuration was being debated in the legislature this year. Is that correct? This is the one that has that component in it that the legislature was being asked to basically outlaw this is in and New York. This is that, a that system right? that would be impacted by that legislation. Okay. There are other systems that are But this is that configuration that we're talking about. So we know this has some controversy. controversy attached to it. So I guess having some public disclosure here is important <laughs> so the public knows what we're doing. I mean, we're, of course, working under the current law, but I understood there was an effort in the legislature to I think basically outlawed this type of a you know, system in New York, but it wasn't successful. So we're still going ahead, which one, I understand. One aspect of it. But, but I, 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 I do agree there's probably some public interest here. Right. So. And, and one of the options that I think the vendor has left open is that even though the machine might be capable of doing both, is to uh, separate. Okay. Right, because even though the Expresso Excel can theoretically act as a ballot mark device, only, but also a ballot marking device on the tabulator, um, you know, the concerns over the security of the ballot marking and the scanning of the ballot, if you were to break that out, it can still produce uh, voter cards with the voter's choices, and then that itself can be scanned on a separate DS200 or DS300. Okay. And that would apply with uh, the legislation. The legislation. The passed. Okay. Um, okay. But, okay. So I think, okay. you know, well, we'll put, what we're I mean, pushing for transparency. Yeah, know, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of going ahead with the testing and see where we are, but I just think we should be aware that there is public interest in this, and I agree with the commissioner that we should be out there making sure people know what we're doing with this, and people want to observe. They should be given a chance to observe and comment and whatever else uh, they want to do. So I'll take that as a second of sure. the resolution. Sure. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Do we need a motion to change the procedure? I don't think you do. Okay. We have I'll take your word for it. Consensus of all four commissioners. <laughs> okay, but we'll still vote on resolution uh, 2212, which is to authorize their clear ballot review. I think all of our prior comments will fly to this system as well, right. although this one is not uh, anywhere near as controversial. Um, so, uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's adopted. And, uh, okay, resolution 2213. 
to adopt amendments to part 6211.6 through 9 related to voter history and prevention of duplicate voting. Um, so this is to make the proposed resolutions permanent, is that it? I believe it is the because proposed the proposed regulation. Yes. Right. This is the change to, as I mentioned before, uh, talking about the statewide data match. Uh, previously, our regulations had two different time frames, one for the primary and one for the general. Uh, as a result of the change of law with regard to the early canvassing of absentee ballots and the, uh, the canvass of affidavit ballots happening on the fourth business day after the election, it required us to move up the deadline for that data and make it uh, standardized for both types of elections. So the change was that the counties had to provide the information to the state board within three days of the election. So so you implemented that this year? Correct. So boards had to report within three days? Did yeah. they have any problems meeting uh, that, that deadline? For the most part, most of them were able to get there in time. I mean, we, uh, I think I did receive a file as late as Saturday morning, um, and I was, we were able to implement that in. Uh, but for the most part, by the end of the day, by the time I left here on Friday, we had most of the county's data. So this just changing the dates. Uh, just so moving, yeah. So it's really going to change the process. Now. Correct. No. And, and, and just a offhand question. What happens when a board doesn't meet the deadline? We say three days and they well, take six. Well, a bunch of phone calls that phone last phone calls. day they're being hounded they're by being us. Hounded. We, don't, we don't really have a um, mechanism to force it. It just, we are asking well, them in essence so, to do this within three days and hopefully they will. And it sounds like most of them are, which is great, but I'm just curious. If, and, and if they don't, I guess theoretically we could go to court. Yeah, I know. And, and one of the nice things though, though, is that it is a manual process because it does require the county boards to export information out of their voter registration systems and also to compile the information on their voters who are voting by affidavit ballot, which is often a very much of a data uh, entry process. Sometimes they can get it off of their e-poll books, sometimes it's more manual. Um, as we go forward now with the absentee tracker, which also tracks affidavit, that information is going to be fed um, systematically from their VR systems into Nice Voter. And so it's likely that once everything is fully up and running and integrated, we won't need to ask the counties for the information anymore. We can just extract it right out of my phone. So that's the goal is we that will have the, the information ourselves, yeah. resident here, that we can actually just pull out of it. So this way we don't have to. What kind of, time frame would we be able to do that in, do you think? What, I mean, I don't know. Michael, do you have a well, sense of that? Or? Well, the uh, local VR vendors should, uh, once they are fully supplying us the information that we've asked for, um, so we would anticipate by end of the year, I think. Yeah, I would so, say yeah, so for next next year's election, election, do you yeah. think we'd have that? I think we'd have like a much better process we, to me. We've given them, we the VR vendors, we told them that their deadline to complete this at the end of the year. That'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. All right, so are we ready to vote on this? Sure. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so 2213 is adopted. 2214 are... Uh, uh, regulations, uh, the, the same regulations, 6217.6-9, uh, 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 relating to gender designations for voter identification verification. And, uh, Yeah, the, unfortunately. I think uh, it looks like the middle two pages yeah. are the old ones. Yeah, so middle two pages. Page. So the first and last page are correct. Wait, I only have two, oh, pages. two pages. Oh, well, then you're all set. Well, we have, you have the right, right. <laughs> right. one. Right. You have the right one. So this is the one where DMV right. removed gender off yeah. their form, so we no longer capture gender as part of our information from DMV? Is that what it is? Or? Yeah, it's, it's along those lines. We, we do capture gender. Uh, however, we're not intending to use it any longer based on this for an identification purpose. And that's because? It, the different uh, classification of gender that DMV has as opposed to- They have more than male and female now, right. is that right? They've right. added, and that would not be helpful to us to know? Is that what we've concluded? Uh, no, ours is optional. Yeah. It's right. optional now. Right. So, yes. Yeah. But uh, it's not helpful because this is another identification point for a voter. 
And I'm just trying to understand. So if a DMV captures, I don't even know what their form says now. It's male, female, uh, something internet. else. There's uh, intersex. Um, yeah, unknown and intersex. Yeah. The other so our capturing what what they do have is no longer useful to us because of that change. Is that our conclusion? I believe we're capturing the data if it's a voter registration right. transaction or it would be in the future. I think it's a matter of when we leverage our connection with DMV to kind of verify identification. Um, normally, that's either done with the DMV number or the Social Security number. Um, so I think that gender may have been included in that kind of data match before, and now it's being removed from the regulation. But it, but it doesn't it have to do with this change in the DMV form? We, 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 were, we were still capturing when DMV just did male, female. Now we're eliminating it because DMV's expanded the number of genders that you can choose. And I'm just trying to understand why that expansion would cause us to just drop the whole thing rather than trying to accommodate it or use or use what is useful to us and rather than just eliminating it. The, the problem would in part be um, false uh, negatives. Um, so if somebody does not supply us with um, with a gender, or if they had previously supplied us with a men, uh, gender such as male or female, and they now identify otherwise as DMV, mm -hmm. um, will receive a mismatch even if all the other criteria uh, does match. So it simply makes more work at the county side for them to then go through and uh, verify that that is a match, uh, even though we said it was not based upon gender not matching. And then part of it is also a limitation on the, on the part of the local VR vendor system. Um, not all of them are able to kind of capture the, the, the multiple, the new genders as well. So it would require changes in their system and our system to accommodate those changes. Okay, so so under this, we would be left with the driver's license or non-driver number and name. And, and date, of date of birth. I'm sorry, and date of birth. So we'd have three elements yeah. match, not four, yeah. basically. So we get the non, we get the driver's license number we would either get a driver's license number or a non-driver ID. Or that too. Their size. So on the form right now, if you're filling out a voter registration form. Online. Uh, or on paper. You, you, can, your driver's license? you can give your, either your driver's license or non-driver's ID, your last four of your social security, or you can state that you do not have either of those two. But if you provide either uh, any of the first two, we leverage our connection with uh, DMV to check both. So DMV, what happens is, let's say a county board receives a voter registration form in some way, shape, or form. They enter in that voter's information to their system, including the driver's license number that was provided. It then sends it up to NICE voter. NICE voter then checks with DMV and says, hey, I have this voter with this uh, driver's license number. Do you have a match? And, and DMV tells us yes or no. All through the computer. I'm sorry? All through the computer. Yeah. Correct. And so, therefore, it'll tell us if the ID has been verified. The information the license, we don't ask to the birth certificate. No. You can provide, uh, I believe, a person as, as, as part of an ID. There are different other like pieces that like, you can use a utility bill if you want right. to verify your identification. This is just for verifying your identification. At registration. At registration. Three times. You understand. And so if you also provided just a last four of your social, we do pass that information along the DMV, and then DMV has a connection to the social security administration. The point system. You aware of that? Yes. But their, their proof of identity for their point system is different from what we're doing just to verify the, uh, the ID. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Yeah, I just, I just want to go on record right. and say I don't think this is a good idea necessarily, but I think we're in, in a sense being forced into it really by DMV's changes. So I yeah. think we don't really have too many DMV options changes. here, but I think you know, the more identifiers we have, the better to verify the legitimacy of our voter registration system. But I understand the changes are the DMV affecting changes us. are statutory. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember why DMV more. ended up changing theirs. So. No, no. I don't know. They were statutory. They did, they did a, there was a bill and was it was a change to so the added, added yeah, um, gen, new gender. It is what it is. All right. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? So that resolution is adopted. And I believe that concludes our business for today. Do we have a next meeting day set? I think the 15th, right? August 15th. August 15th. Okay.
Is that all set with everybody? Possible August 30th, right? Monday the 15th is our next. What are we talking about? August 15th? August 15th, Monday the 15th is our date. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Then August 30th is needed. Right. Right. That's, yep. Yep. That's that. Okay. All right, so uh, those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. To adjourn. aye. Opposed? All right, so we stand adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Liz Foster, voter, family, most of you.